So thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I'm very uh, uh, proud to be invited to, to do the Hansborough Lecture. John Hansborough really was a, uh, in burn surgery, for those of y'all who don't do this, really was a, a uh, key player in many of the things that we do in today's uh, uh, in the things that you're doing to your patients today John Hansborough participated if he didn't direct many of those advances and uh, uh, we are you know I knew him and you know when we talked we were talking last night about it, when you go back to the literature remember when you write something you write a paper somebody may look at that a hundred years from now and say God what, would, what did they mean and so many of the things, when I was starting out in, uh, in investigative things, many of the papers said John Hansborough on the bottom of them, and that, that, uh, or at the top of them, or whatever, that somewhere in there, John Hansborough was involved in many of the things that we do today. In fact, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, he, he was kind of a pioneer. So I'm very, uh, uh, very proud to be uh, invited to, uh, to do this lecture. So uh, some caveats. So this is. Uh, uh, a, something I've been termed uh, burn care 2010, but I'm, what I wanted to focus on mostly is what, what's happened in the military and what, what kind of advances have occurred based on this conflict that we're in. And if you look back at history, I'm, you know, the older you get, the more historical you become, or the more of a student of history you become, because you live some of it, I think. And the, uh, what, what you look back at the history of surgery, and particularly surgery of injury, and me most of the advances have occurred not during the conflicts, but right after them. And that, or that's where you, you get the, the, where much of the uh, uh, credit for them occurs. And uh, you look at you know, ambulances w that occurred because of the Napoleonic Wars. And you look at uh, uh, some of the, many of the other, th so the Vietnam War, we got ARDS and ventilators and uh, uh, dialysis, mach dialysis machines. And the, the development of critical care basically was, was as a result of the, of the Vietnam conflict. And uh, so and knowing that, I said, okay, what's going to be the big deal for Burns? from this conflict? What, 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 what are we going to be known for? What's going to happen? And hopefully we'll show you some of the things that I think are going to be uh, known 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now as this, this is what, uh, what happened. Oh, that's one other caveat. I am not in the military. Okay, I was hired as a civilian, as a hired gun to come in and help out during the, uh, during the uh, uh, conflict. And uh, was you know very uh, happy to do it, and uh, I've learned a lot, and hopefully uh, uh, some other folks have learned what from what I know as well. So this is a uh, a slide that shows the the history of uh, of the ISR, and it started in uh, or for those of you who don't know, the, the U.S. Army Institute of Surgical Research is its own thing in the inside of the Army uh, healthcare system, and uh, what it there's all these command structures, the ISR is off in a separate place. And uh, the, the uh, a chain of command actually comes down through the research organization and not through the, the, uh, uh, the medical command. Uh, anyway, so that was set up on purpose because in 1947, everybody thought a bomb was going to go off somewhere. And we need to know uh, how to take care of nuclear, bomb, nuclear injuries. And so uh, you can see that it was established in 1947, uh, moved to San Antonio shortly thereafter. Uh, was established in, in the, the Brook the uh, Army Hospital, Brook Army Medical Center, but as a separate command. Are we, the general we answer to is in Maryland, not the, ne the next floor up. And so it's an interesting kind of situation. And then this is the, uh, the bottom is where we are now, and that's even different. They've, you know, gave us another $14 billion or whatever to build some more stuff onto that. Uh, and so that there's even more buildings coming up, and we're uh, doubling in size shortly, uh, uh, not too far in the distant future. So we, uh, what does the ISR do? Well, we take care of the, all the civilian, adult civilian burns uh, from South Texas. And that's a big area, uh, just like y'all do here. And, uh, and that's one of the missions. The primary mission, however, is caring for combat casualties. And it is the sole burn center. So if you get burned, if you're in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, you will show up in San Antonio. Uh, and that's a good thing, I think, because we can centralize everything and so that, that uh, uh, inv investigations can proceed quicker, plus you know what's actually happening. And so in the conflict, I don't have any of this stuff up here, but we noticed 2004 or so that, uh, gosh, we're getting a lot of burns, not combat-related burns, but a lot of burns on people's hands and faces from igniting 
uh, fires, and they were using you know, jet fuel or gasoline or something like that. So why are all these guys lighting fires? Well, it turns out in a mobile phase of a, of a conflict is that you're, the human excrement, waste, whatever, has to be burned. Who gets to burn it? The guy, whoever the private guy is. What does he use? Whatever is available. And the stuff, uh, you know, so they use gasoline. Gasoline would blow up. And just like we get, you know, in your burn center, you see a lot of injuries that, of stupid people doing stupid things with gasoline. And that's what they were doing. And so we, we saw 15 or 20 of these, and we were able to say, to send a note to the Surgeon General saying, hey, Surgeon General, uh, you need to stop that. That should not happen anymore. Uh, these are preventable injuries. And so he sends down what's called an Alleract says, you will stop this practice, and gone. And, uh, but you know, you had to, we had to gather up enough data to show that happened, but that's the beautiful thing about the military is that you can't actually make a change, and if you can get it high enough in the chain of command to get somebody to say it, it actually happens that way. And uh, so some of these preventative efforts, and that's what one of the good things about having a, a single burn center does. All right, so our civilian casualties, that's our ca casualty area there. And we see about 250, 300 civilians a year. And then during the conflict, we were seeing about 250 to 300 in 2005, 2006, which was when all the IEDs were blowing up. And that's where we saw a bunch. And then, you know, that's, but that's going to be a very variable thing depending on the op tempo and, and what uh, uh, tactics are being used. Uh, but for civilians, it's pretty, pretty solid, about 250 to 300. For the combat casualties, uh, just briefly, as you know, what happens is they'll get hurt somewhere. They'll take me and take it care of immediately by an embedded medic or a corpsman. Uh, they'll go to a four, what's a level two facility, which is called a forward <coughs> surgical team, which includes a, a surgeon and an anesthesiologist mostly to stabilize people. Uh, then the combat support will go then to transport it to a level three facility, which is a cache, what we refer to as a cache, which is a MASH unit, okay, so that it's got everything that you need, CT scans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it is actually a tertiary, you know, can fu functions as a tertiary care center. And then from there, they're transported to Germany and then to a, what, a hospital in the United States. In our case, it's uh, the ISR. That process ha takes about 96 hours, 72 to 96 hours uh, from injury to the time <coughs> that they're at a definitive care center in the, in the U.S. Uh, we're a little bit different in that uh, if we hear that a, a bunch of casualties are coming through with big burns, we'll meet them here. And so that their burn care actually starts at about uh, uh, 36 hours after their injury. Most of these guys don't uh, get transported out of, or they get transported out of theater within 24 hours if they have a significant injury. This is way different than any other conflict that we've had before. Most of the time, you know, you have Yokohama General Hospital for uh, for Vietnam where the burn patients would sit for two or three weeks before they came over. And now that, that's actually two or three days. And uh, so that's, that's kind of how things are going. They, we transport these patients by critical care, uh, or CCAT teams is what it's called, and uh, we meet them in Germany to, uh, to take care of them. So we, so we have these two uh, different populations. We had a natural experiment that we could take advantage of. And, that, uh, and we thought that, gosh, uh, uh, these guys that have to fly for 96 hours and get hurt in a, com in, in a combat casualty center and they're gonna, or they're, they're in the middle of a conflict, they're getting hurt there. I bet you they do worse than uh, civilians. And so our hypothesis was that they're going to be poor because of the distance of evacuation. There's other injuries. When things blow up, you get hit by fragments and other things like that. Oh, and by the way, when you show that picture of Dr. Hansborough, you get that look. We have the same one with Dr. Pruitt. And the best one to get a you know, white-lipped white, white finger shaking is to say the, the term shrapnel uh, to, to describe you know, what happens when you get hit by fragments. Shrapnel is a very particular weapon that was used in World War I. And, uh, and so if you wanted to spend an hour talking about weaponry uh, with Dr. Pruitt, that's what you said, is the word shrapnel. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the, uh, there's uh, these other injuries that are going to happen, and then there's also the time of definitive care. And so we, did, uh, we reviewed all our records for these kind of things, the age, burn size, inhalation injury, non-burn injuries, injury severity score, and then their outcomes, uh, mortality, hospital length of stay, uh, the usual stuff that you're used to seeing. And what we found is that we had, at the time that we did the study, that about uh, 250 uh, military and about 500 civilians. And we found that, not, not uh, surprisingly, that the military uh, population was younger. Uh, time to arrival from injury was much more. Uh, there was a higher incidence of inhalation injury. And uh, 
The, uh, but the TBSA burned and the TBSA full thickness burn was not different, a little bit higher for the, for the uh, military. But this is, that really surprised me. I thought, oh, come on, they're going to have bigger burns because, uh, but it's not. The, when you get burned in a civilian center and you actually show up to a hospital and you get burned in, in a military setting and show up to a hospital, the distribution of burns was the same. The burn size was the same. It was very shocking to me. I thought it would be higher. What we found is that, so you can see here that if you put them side by side in a frequency distribution, uh, they're not any different. And in fact, most of the burns, as expected, are, are relatively small, and then it uh, goes down in a first order distribution thereafter. And for, uh, for those of you who are going to do research or are getting ready to do research or been in the lab for a while, highly recommend always doing this with your data. Make a frequency distribution because it really gives you the, a much better feel for what's going on with, uh, between the two groups. But there were some differences, right, in that uh, the hand and the uh, net, head and neck are the, were, uh, much, were more often injured in the military casualties. That, it makes sense because they've got body armor on, right, so they're not going to get burned behind the body armor. And, uh, and the only thing that's really exposed are their hands and face, and so that's why they get burned more often there. <laughs> Uh, if you look at the days of arrival for the military, that uh, it turns out that the bigger burns actually showed up faster. Okay, which is again, I think what you'd expect is that, oh my gosh, get them out of my hospital and get them to a burn center. And that's what actually occurred there. And the demographics, there was a higher injury severity score, obviously, in the, in the military uh, and had a higher instance of non-burn injury. Uh, and you can see that there. What, uh, what was curious, though, was we thought, okay, well, remember our hypothesis was they're going to do worse. Well, no, they did better. And uh, <laughs> the mortality was lower. And uh, if we limited the, uh, remember that we were seeing old people in, a, in our burn center, if you take them out, and why did I say 48 years? Well, that was the oldest military casualty we had. So I said, okay, well, we're just going to take everybody out above 48, and we still find that there's, there's uh, no difference in, in mortality and uh, the size of the burns that died was not any different either. And so what that means then is our, our, I think we can reject our hypothesis. Time to death was basically the same. Uh, so, uh, and then other variables other associated with mortality were, uh, you can see that when we put it all together into this multivariate logistic regression, the usual stuff comes to the forefront. Age, TBSA, inhalation injury, uh, injury to admission, uh, was, was significant. ISS and uh, ventilator days obviously was, uh, was another thing that was, was important, but the problem is is that how do you use you know, actually ventilator free days is what we ended up uh, using in, in this final analysis. And then when you put it all together, these are the things that were important. Uh, uh, age, burn size, inhalation injury, and, and days that you're on a ventilator. And we, we, I'd shown this at, with David in, uh, in Galveston in pediatric burns uh, many years ago that uh, the de number of days you're on the ventilator is actually the biggest deal. And you so, say, okay, well, we've got to get people off the ventilator. No, they're on the ventilator for a reason. Okay, so, cause so it's, it's reflecting the biology. It's not reflecting your, your care in some way. And so uh, that ended up being a big deal. And we put this into these rock curves. And uh, we did find there were some differences. The military stayed at the hospital longer. Uh, and those who survived, uh, that's because of the, the logistics and the way things go in the military. But everything else was the same, ICU days, days on the ventilator, and the number of operations that they received. And so, uh, and finally, in the outcomes, as far as functional outcomes, we kind of asked our, our therapists to go, okay, did they do okay, did they not do okay, or they what? And again, there was no, uh, no differences between these groups and outcomes. So in summary, what we found is that civilian patients differed from uh, military patients and that they had a longer time of definitive care, higher full thickness burns, higher insulin ventilation injury, more non-burn injury, uh, but they were similar in total burn size. The burn size distribution was the same. Uh, mortality was the same. Time to death and those who died was the same. ICU days, ventilator days, the same. Gross functional outcomes are the same. So what that means to me is that uh, you're burned, uh, whether you have a uniform on or not, Okay, the outcomes are the same. What, however you get burned, yes, that occurred. Uh, but whether you have a uniform on or not, the response is the same in a similar treatment situation and that the uh, military burns don't do worse. They do just the same as the civilians do. So what does that mean for research? Well, what that means then is that whatever you show in civilians can be directly applied to, the, to military casualty. Okay. Same thing, whatever you show in military casualties can be directly applied to the civilians. It's not different. The 
And then, you know, when you think about it from a global, more philosophic term, of course, the DNA is not different, right? And so that's, uh, that I think is important that we showed this and we've, we've beat this onto, our, uh, onto the Surgeon General and to the you know, Chiefs of Staff and of, of everybody whenever they try to get at our funding. As we go, you know, uh, we have to take care of civilians because we have to do this research to improve combat casualty care. And by the way, we need to do fund research in the civilian burn centers and trauma centers because that's whatever you can apply in there is also going to be true for combat casualties. Yeah, the number of admissions that we've had uh, bumped again uh, in between uh, 2004 and 2007, that was mostly due, had to do with the IED, IEDs. When you think about burns in the USA, however, I'm going to kind of shift gears, is they've been decreasing in number. If you look at per cap, uh, the, the total number as well as the per capita is going to be even more than this. It's the number of burns we've been seeing in the United States is decreasing over time and the burn deaths have uh, significantly decreased in a linear way. And w we, uh, we think that uh, those reasons are because we're better at preventing burns, I think is probably the major deal. Uh, but the other thing is that I think we're a little bit better at taking care of them. Uh, what the, what the, in the military though, we've been thinking a lot about over the last four, five, six, seven years now is, is mass casualties. And that you're gonna have some events that uh, uh, are le relatively low probability but high impact. Uh, you know, somebody put a bomb in Qualcomm Stadium or something like that. What are you going to do? And uh, uh, it turns out in the military, the most common injury mechanism is explosion or was uh, in, uh, in the Iraq conflict. And about 12% of evacuated casualties had, were from explosions. 6% uh, of U.S. casualties were burns. Okay, so that uh, uh, in conflicts, it turns out when <coughs> stuff blows up that people are going to get burned. In the civilian setting with a mass casualty, the most likely cause will be an explosion. Okay, it's not, li it's not going to be sarin gas. I guess that could occur. It's not going to be a biological thing. I guess it can. But the most likely thing, the most easiest, simple thing to do is to take a bomb inside of a crowded place and blow it up. It's happening daily in Iraq right now. And uh, so... What, what happens in those situations? Well, most of the time, most of the people that are there are not hurt. They think they are. So they clog up your system. And uh, how, the, the, the real challenge is how do you get to those who actually are hurt? Terrorists prefer simple, easily accessible weapons, uh, and burns and fragment injuries are the most likely to occur in mass in these incidents. And so when you're, when you're doing uh, disaster planning in San Diego, this is what you, you know, make sure that this is somewhere on your list about how do you deal with these explosions. We've had uh, some uh, experience with these uh, kind of incidences lately in, uh, in the world uh, in, in, in almost on a daily basis in Iraq and Afghanistan in, in the 2005, 2006, but you know, the Oklahoma City, et cetera. And then this one, what do you do with this one? And there's a nuclear event, 50,000 burn casualties. Well, uh, what we've decided uh, in the military is that you can't really plan for this, okay? Uh, it's, it, it's too expensive. Uh, to uh, be able to do this. What you need to be able to do is to uh, build your system on being able to respond to hundreds of patients and then take a fractal kind of approach to in increasing that uh, uh, should this thing occur. So uh, number one, we, uh, we went through an uh, analysis to say, okay, well, we're in this conflict. What if we get uh, uh, 50,000 burn cavities from Iraq? What do we do with them? Uh, well, so we said, well, there's all this burn capacity bed in the United States, some in San Diego, some in, you know, Irvine, some of these other places. How many burn beds are actually available at any one time? It turns out it's about 400 in the country. This is including all of them. And because we, you know, got sergeants, whoever, on the phone and was calling everybody every day, how many do you, <laughs> how many do you have? And uh, this is it. So uh, if we had 1,000 burn casualties, which would be, oh, that's not going to be a big deal. You blow something up in the Super Bowl, it should have no more than 1,000. You, know, you should be able to deal with that. The United States right now cannot deal with that volume. So, but that's okay. Why? I mean, why, why should we set aside resources to deal with that volume for a p potential risk when there are uh, real risks that we're seeing every day? Car crashes, uh, you know, gunshot wounds, uh, falls from a height from a 70-year-old, whatever. So... Uh, so this is, you know, I put this up here just not to have a solution, but to say that, you know, thinking that there's capacity out there is probably not going to do it. I usually show this slide of uh, burn mortality to show that uh, things have gotten better. Uh, remember I showed that the, there's a been a decrease in burn mortality. 
Uh, if you can see that Bull and Fisher's report, and this is mostly post-World War II data, you see that a burn side, a 50% burn killed about half the children in, uh, in, in the 40s. Now, uh, now it's down to, you know, there's, there is no burn size in a child that is not survival. Over 50% survivor. So that doesn't mean there's not any deaths that occur. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But every child, any child with any size burn should be expected to survive. Okay, they may not. Uh, and then the same thing, we're, we're moving that towards that in, in, you know, relatively young adults. You can see we haven't done much at all in the elderly. Uh, and so I think that's, that's going to be something that's going to, we'll, continue to be working on in the future. Uh, but just to show that, that again, that mortality is, is significantly improved over time. We did this study, uh, I did the study with Dave Herndon where we looked at, okay, well, can you predict when somebody's gonna die? And we kind of broke up our uh, variables into c characteristics of the injury itself, some things that happened during transport, what they look like at admission to the tertiary care hospital, and then things that happened during the hospital course. And, uh, and these are the, the variables that we, used and what we found is that uh, eh, when it comes down to a multivariate logistic regression there's you know hundreds of variables now the things that mattered were age whether they got septic okay while they're in the hospital this is all within the first 28 days and then the, the days of ventilatory support in the first 28 days notice that I didn't put in there base deficit base deficit fell out inhalation injury fell out burn size fell out okay what mattered are these things and these things you don't collect until you're in the hospital for a while. Okay, you've got to be in the hospital for 28 days. So what we concluded from this is that uh, you can't tell in a child, these are all children now, you cannot tell in a child whether they're going to live or die by, based on what they look like when you first see them. You have to have stuff that, that happens during the hospitalization. And so I, I tell you this is a great story that uh, uh, for the, some of the folks that are starting their research careers and that uh, our first paper was published in Annals of Surgery and showed the thing, and then we validated it in another 100 patients uh, and found out it was, it was spot on. And so we sent that to The Lancet and said, hey, this is a great paper. We want it to be uh, published in The Lancet. And uh, they fiddled around with it for a while and then sent it back to us and said, no, it's rejected. And so the British like for you to whine a little bit sometimes. And so we whined. <laughs> we, we wrote back a letter to the editor saying, you know, this is really, they said, well, you should put it in a burn journal. I said, no, 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 this is important because what's happening is these p kids get pithed someplace else that, that, that not burn care providers are making these decisions about, you know, a 99% burn in a kid, well, there's no way he's going to survive, or, nor does he want, to, want them to survive. And so we're just going to uh, turn him off. And so I said, no, this is a burn care journal. Nobody's ever, those people are not going to see this. It needs to be in your journal. And they said, oh, okay, we'll publish it. <laughs> so uh, sometimes you have to uh, stand up for yourself a little bit, and that's what we did with, uh, with this paper. And you can see when you, this is part of that thing there, you can tell that you can't really tell early on based on the injury or the transport characteristics or the admission when you start seeing the discrimination uh, with stuff that you put in during the hospitalization. So uh, along those lines, there's modern treatments, and now, uh, remember I told you what, I'm going to, hopefully show you stuff that we're doing in the Army that has made an effect, and I think these are it. When you look at uh, uh, things that are going to affect mortality, uh, from our perspective is, is things that are happening with resuscitation, can we be better than we are, uh, early excision of the burn wound with rapid epidermal coverage, uh, metabolic enhancers, functional rehabilitation, and then I would be remiss if I didn't at least show you some of this regenerative medicine stuff that we've been doing. So what we noted when, uh, when we first got started that there's, uh, uh, these guys are getting blown up, they had big burns, folks were taking care of them that had not taken care of burns before, a lot of uh, uh, relatively young guys in their, in their practice because that's the usual military physician is not the, uh, the guy who's been in practice for four years, it's usually the guy who's been in practice for four months. Uh, <laughs> that's the way things are. And so, okay, burns, I know I'm supposed to give them a bunch of fluid, and so sure they did get a lot of fluid. And then they, you know, they get, but th what they developed was this term that I call resuscitation morbidity. They were over resuscitated. You can see this picture of uh, uh, this here, you know, it's clearly edematous. Uh, we're talking about open abdomens and uh, uh, compartment syndromes. And they were, you know, these guys were getting thigh fasciotomies for burns. Like, you know, what in the heck? I mean, I've never done a thigh fasciotomy for anything. Uh, other than a gunshot wound to the thigh, 
And uh, how can you be doing it? Well, it turns out that there was, they were getting resuscitated and over-resuscitated because they didn't have a lot of direction. Uh, there's also this, we were seeing a lot of this abdominal compartment syndrome. I remember, you know, six, seven, eight, ten years ago, that was the rage, right? And then, oh, we must open the abdomens of these guys. And so that's what we did. And uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of these things, but I, I would propose to you that the reason for this is the best way to treat this injury is to prevent it. Uh, and I'll show you that data here in a second. So what we did, we... Uh, uh, I said, well, you're, you're being over-resuscitated. So we simply did nothing more than did another one of these Alaracs in the Army. Uh, this is a piece of paper that says how much went in and what were their urine output. You will fill this out uh, wherever they are, and, uh, then, uh, and then you will look at it when you decide what you're going to be doing. And so what would happen is these guys would get you know, 20 <clears throat> liters of fluid, and somebody would finally show up in and, uh, and one of the caches and go, hey, I think they got too much fluid, and they would slow it down. What we found is just filling out the form so that you knew, so that, so that we can communicate effectively through the through the levels of care, that uh, uh, we were able to decrease the incidence of uh, abdominal compartment syndrome and the composite endpoint of ACS and mortality significantly decreased simply by filling out the form. So this is this is an argument for medical records. Okay, <laughs> it does make some sense to do that. Uh, but we we looked at our overall experience from 2003 to current. We had 19 decompressive laparotomies. Mortality was 100 percent. A big burns. This does not work in our in our hand uh, in our hands. There's going to be the occasional one that will survive this, but uh, smaller burns are going to do better. But if you open the abdomen in a big burn, they're not probably going to do well. There are some some case reports of people surviving this, but so the thought, the, our thought is, well, you should prevent it, really, uh, rather than trying to figure out how to treat it. We did another uh, paper in the, uh, that we presented at the Southern about abdominal catastrophes and burn size, and we found that you know, there's a linear relationship between uh, big burns, there's a, a higher incidence of uh, these abdominal catastrophes. And this would be you know, the guy that's in, the, the ACS guy, as well as the guy who's been in the hospital for two, you know, maybe a week or two, and then all of a sudden gets an abdominal, abdominal extension and, and gut <coughs> dies for some reason. Uh, and that happens with bigger burns as well. Uh, again, mortality is very high in the ACS or ischemia group, and, then, and it happens with uh, bigger burns more often. So how do you prevent that? Well, uh, we've got this computer technology, and, and I know Dr. Hansborough would love this, would have loved this. And we said, okay, tell you what, we're going to develop a model of what the normal biologic response is to, to injury and resuscitation. And uh, what it's going to do is we'll put the data into it and the computer will decide what their likely urine output is going to be next hour based on what's going in and it will give you a recommendation. Uh, so this is all control theory kind of stuff. And uh, so what we did is we, we looked at uh, 30 or 40 patients and said, okay, this is the normal response. Okay, we didn't do anything, just wrote down uh, in a very meticulous way about how much fluid went in, how much fluid was coming out. And then we're able to show that there's really three different linear phases of response to injury. And then uh, came up with this model uh, to uh, say this is what happens uh, during resuscitation. And then put it in a Windows PC version and so we can see that this is net in, net out, cumulative fluids uh, in, cumulative fluids out. And so we're able to, to with the engineers, that's not me, but the engineers will say this is what we're going to do. And what happens in reality <coughs> is that you put them on the system and the uh, uh, you say you put in your, your urine output and your infusion volume for that last hour, and it goes click. Inf infusion 500 cc's, okay, and that's the that's the re now that's a recommendation. It's not a closed loop system, it's, but it's a recommendation to about what what should we, should we do at that point, point. Uh, and you can either take the recommendation or not, and then uh, go forward from that. And so we did this, and uh, remember we had a control group, uh, which was here, and this is how much fluid they were getting. When we did this thing, what happens is that the recommendation says, so you're an intern, right? And uh, you've got the stuff, stuff going in at 800 cc's an hour, and the guy's urine output is uh, 150 cc's. Okay, the machine says, uh, go down to 350. Dramatic change. Uh, whereas you would say, gosh, I might go down by 100 or 200. And it's going to say, no, go down by another 500. And it gives, what it really does is it gives you permission to do what you think, which is probably the right thing to do anyway. Uh, but it gives you permission so that your, your cumulative fluid uh, <coughs> decreases significantly. Plus, the other thing is it actually gives the non-expert provider, this is what we think works. 
And so what you end up with is a much, much lower volumes going in because uh, it kind of exports expertise, if you will. And if you look at the urine output in, in comparison, it was still higher out here, lower than this, the control group, but it's still a little bit higher. The reason why is that even though the, the, uh, uh, we've got, we're doing the mathematical analysis now, it shows if you'd actually done what the computer said, it would be in here. The reason why these was excessive volume is because this, the provider did not accept the, the uh, the thing of the, so I think that uh, Dr. Hansborough would have loved this kind of deal. Say, hey, this is perfect. This is exactly what I want. Because so you're, you're, ex you're exporting knowledge, or you're exporting expertise and how to resuscitate people with this machine. And, uh, and, it's, and it's providing educational opportunities to the, the people who are actually doing it. The other thing we've been kind of working on is something called a KMAC value and that, uh, uh, to, not to get too in depth into the math of this, but we give, we calculate volumes uh, based on the uh, uh, volumes to give based on age and burns or based on burn size uh, but we don't put into that any kind of assessment of urine output so what we did is a KMAC value and we said okay this is how much you're supposed to have going in and this is how much uh, urine output ends up with a KMAC and how did that come up with that well the guy's name is Joe Kelly and Dan McLaughlin the fellows that worked on this. So fellow, you fellows out there, make sure that, you know, some of your mentors will actually let you put your name on stuff. And <laughs> so that we've done this and uh, found that the people that, now you get a number, a number after, every, at after every hour during resuscitation. And what we found is that the people with higher values, okay, were indicating that they had a lot of volume in and not so much out, did poorly. Okay, well that's not surprising. Uh, but we found also that you could tell that who was going to be that person at about this time. Okay, so you can tell who's not going to do well at about eight or nine hours into, into the resuscitation. And Bruce, you know that. You say, oh, this guy's not going to do well. How do you know? I don't know. Uh, but he should be doing better right now than he is, but he's not. And so uh, that's, that's, those are the things I think we're going to be able to, to, to do. I hope from this conflict is that this kind of technology or this kind of way of thinking about things is one of the things that's going to come about from this conflict is, is how do we do better up front? And I think it's going to, you know, there'll be stuff for trauma resuscitations and things like that, which will be also, you know, how, how much blood to use and when. And it burns a little easier because it happens over a 24, 48 hour period, whereas in trauma you got an hour, right? But maybe it will, who knows? Uh, early excision and grafting is important. This is another thing that I think Dr. Hansborough was very uh, uh, thought about a lot. Uh, the thing is, if you've got a, a deep burn, it needs to come off at some point, and uh, the grafting and the usual kind of stuff that we do. The typical course of treatment in a 40% burn is, uh, uh, from our perspective, is I take, a, take it all off at the same setting within 48 hours of burn. Some other people do it uh, uh, with, go back repeatedly to do it, but that's okay. Uh, but, but I think what, what's important to do is to get it all off. and. Uh, what we think, what I do a lot is this four to one grafting technique where we'll take a widely expanded skin, put allograft on top of it, and uh, 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 to close the wounds. Now, I, I tell the re residents and fellows all the time is that we have a race here. This person is going to get a, an invasive wound infection if we don't get the wound closed. A, w a closed wound does not get infected. And so uh, that's what we gotta try to do. There are other skin er epidermal substitutes that people use. Uh, BioBrain Transite uh, was available for a while, uh, Apograph and Integra, and uh, Allograph skin is still the most important, I think, though, skin substitute in that uh, uh, it's you know, widely available and uh, functions as skin and uh, until you can get the, uh, uh, their own skin to get, to get on them. BioBrain is something that, that a lot of folks use. I love BioBrain for partial thickness burns. Uh, and we showed in, a, in kids that you can uh, decrease their uh, days in the hospital when you use this stuff. And then there's uh, CEA. Now this, uh, this is a technology that's been around for a long time. We found that, uh, that when you use it, uh, it's actually more fragile and you stay in the hospital longer uh, than using st standard regular techniques. Uh, but uh, the scars look better two or three years later. So we've got to keep working on this technology and uh, uh, to get to the point where we're actually uh, able to, to address scars. And then the other thing is this whole notion of dermal substitutes in that uh, 
we can get the wounds closed with aut autograph pretty quickly now. The question is, we, now we need to get better at the wound characteristics or the scar characteristics we need to get better, and it's probably going to be through adding some dermis at some point. So uh, I've talked a lot to the folks in, the, in, in Washington and, and uh, in, uh, in the Army, is that what do you need? So when you talk to the biomedical engineers, you've got a whole bunch of them right around here, right? What, do you, what, is, what does the military need? Well, we need a skin replacement. Okay, when, and what are, the, what are the specs on that? Well, I need this, needs to be available off the shelf. I need as much of it as I want immediately. Okay, not two or three weeks later like CEA, not uh, as a, uh, along those areas. Oh, and by the way, it has to be easy to handle. I don't need to stand on, you know, uh, tie myself by a toe tag by the ceiling to stick it on there and hold my tongue on the left side. Of, you know, Integra is this way. You know, I said, well, if you do it just right, uh, it'll work. I said, well, there shouldn't be any just rights. It should be easily, easy to do. Uh, works every time, inhibits infection, has an, some kind of innate barrier function, and actually decreases scarring. That's what I want. And, uh, uh, oh, and by the way, I want, you know, so that's, so can you imagine you get an 80% burn in? Okay, you take them to the operating room, you excise it, you put this stuff on, you're done. And <laughs> what, you know, what, now what about the other markets? Okay, well, if you could do that with, uh, uh, you know, anything, so orthopedic injuries and these other stuff, if you have a product that does that, there will be lots of other applications for it. And so I think that that's, you know, that's uh, something that we'd like to do. To kind of close up a little of the stuff with the critical care uh, things, the, uh, we've got the, the advances that we've done in resuscitation. I think the other thing that we really uh, took, I think is going to be a big deal is this whole notion of uh, CRRT, and I know most people are doing this now, uh, but we run it. And so what happened was we were having these guys with renal failure, uh, which is not uncommon in burns, and we'd call the nephrologist and say, oh, it doesn't need to be dialyzed yet, and then they'd come in and do intermittent dialysis and say, hey, what about CRRT? These people in Europe are doing all the CRRT. Uh, shouldn't you be doing that? Well, blah, 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 blah. And we did this for a year or two, and then finally said, forget it. We'll, we are the ISR. We'll just buy our own machines, and we'll do it ourselves. So the surgeons run the CRRT. Uh, there's not a nephrologist in sight. And uh, uh, we found that when we did that, that, and this is 18 military patients, and it was similar in, in civilian patients, that there was a significant decrease in 28-day mortality uh, when we had a, a comparison group between, you know, again, 2000, what was it, 2003 to 2005 versus 2005 onward. And were there some other changes? Yes, there were. Uh, but it's stri when you see a, a mortality difference like this, you've got to say, hmm, uh, maybe it's not completely right, but it's at least partially right. And maybe CRRT is a good thing to do. Uh, the, when we did that, uh, we now use CRRT at a drop of a hat. We'll use it during resuscitation. If somebody's not doing well during resuscitation, we'll go right to CRRT rather than trying to do vitamin C and all these other things. And uh, if somebody gets septic and starts to have a, a rifle or Aiken criteria, Aiken 1 or Aiken 2, they go on the machine immediately. And so we've had a, a significant change there. I think that's going to be a big deal. The other thing was uh, that we looked at a lot is this uh, notion of uh, better glycemic control, just like everybody else in the world did. But I think we've, we've uh, uh, we showed that, yes, if you have hyperglycemia controlled, you do better, just like everybody else. We found, interestingly, that everybody was using these, you know, point of care things, glucometers at the bedside, uh, and we were doing that trying to, I was doing this insulin study from this R01, trying to say, we're going to give as much insulin as possible and make their muscles bigger. Well, we found that, gosh, these people are getting hypoglycemic all the time. Uh, when you, you send them to the lab, the, lower, the value was lower than the point of care test was. And we, and we did a bunch of work and found out that this was because the glucometer was wrong. Uh, and it had to do with the, the anemia that we commonly see uh, in, in burn patients. So again, for the residents and fellows and you know, postdocs and everybody else, the observation you make is probably not wrong. And sometimes you need to follow up on it. When do you follow up on it? I don't know. Uh, but if you see something, got to see, think something repeatedly occurs wrong, you say, yeah, I think that there may be something to go on there. The other thing we found is that this variability deal. So uh, we had some guys looking at heart rate variability. We said, I wonder if there's any variability in glucose. It turns out there is. And it turns out it follows a sine wave. It's a regular, it's regular variability. And uh, that you can see that uh, when we looked at uh, across time, uh, the uh, blood glucose does go up and down. And if you lose this variability, they do poorly. 
So it's the same thing that we saw in, uh, in or are seeing in heart rate and respiratory variability is, a, is the same thing as happening in, in glucose patterns. And so this was here as if you take your, your amplitude of change, uh, that the survivors want to change more than non-survivors. Uh, and it was a statistically different deal. So that, that occasional hypoglycemic patient that you see with your insulin drip, that's probably, that's a better sign. This is a sign of survival probably. That <laughs> sometimes. Uh, const, you know, hypoglycemia repeatedly on a, on, a, on a random basis is probably an indicator of, of illness. And we'll, we'll hopefully be uh, getting at that better in, as time goes on. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is this notion of regenerative medicine. And that uh, uh, what we found is that combat injuries uh, often result in loss of tissue and uh, uh, industry and academic research has shown promise in regenerating this tissue to improve functional outcomes. So this picture up here is kind of a famous thing of a guy that cut the end of his finger off uh, with playing with a, a model airplane. And his friend, who's a guy in Pittsburgh, Steve Badalak, said, uh, hey, can you put, you're doing this regenerative medicine stuff, you've grown limbs in mice, what if we put that stuff on my finger? And, you know, a couple months later, uh, you see his fingers grown back. Now, as a skeptic, you can say, eh, Bruce, if I think there are any plastic surgeons in the audience, you can look at it and go, ah, I might do that anyway. Uh, so was it really the stuff that did that? I don't know. But it's, it's certainly worth the deal. So they came down to us and said, hey, you guys want to try this? I said, yeah, I'm crazy enough to try anything. And uh, so we started putting this stuff on, on le in muscle defects and, uh, and, and people with, uh, that had their fingers cut off. And this is just some of the, the basic science stuff behind that. When you think, consider regenerative medicine, you've really got cells. Most of the people talk about stem cells scaffolds or the environment that they're in, as well as the uh, cytokines and things that those cells are producing. Uh, there's a lot of these extracellular matrix can serve as a biological niche. And so we had these guys, with, this is a typical kind of, kind of an injury for us, in that they, they're in an explosion, they lost uh, part of their leg muscle. And so we said, well, what if we put some of that pixie dust, is what people call it, uh, into this muscle defect? Does it make the muscle grow back? And so we made a decision, put some stuff in there, and it did. And so when we did CT scans on things, we found that there was a significant increase in the size of the muscle. And the good thing about muscles, you can actually measure its function. So you just put them you know, on a, uh, on a uh, Cybex machine and you measure their strength. And it turns out that this guy uh, got about 10% stronger at six months. We just tested him again at about a year and a half out. He's 60% he's stronger in that leg. Now, that's an anecdotal one, one person. But I think that maybe we'll be able to do this. And there's, a, there's going to be a lot of things that, uh, what does this regenerative medicine stuff do? Well, it brings in stem cells. It attracts whatever it is, for whatever reason, it's attracting pluripotent cells into it that uh, become muscle, maybe. I don't know. We've got that, now we have to go back to the lab. You know, now I've seen this in people, we've got to figure out what, what exactly is going on here. And a lot of uh, techniques to do that. Uh, the, so, uh, but that, this is an intriguing clinical finding, and this is another guy that we did. You can see that, uh, uh, where'd that thing go? This, there's a, something, something I can't see it from here, but there's something up in here that shows that, the, that it's definitely bigger, this whole thing there, than it was before. So, uh, what does a tissue response look like during the in vivo remodeling phase? Don't really know. The other thing we've been doing is these fingers. This doesn't work. Okay, I think the, the muscle thing probably did work relatively well uh, because it's a homogeneous tissue. Uh, whereas this thing, there's bone and all kinds of other stuff. And we tried, this is like three, three or four times in this guy, and we got about a half an inch, but there's no bone in it. Uh, so I don't know that this finger thing is really going to work out. So in conclusion, burn mortality is significantly improved. Burn disasters are most likely to involve significant numbers of minor burns and a few major burn patients and then we got some frontiers we've been working on. Uh, resuscitation, we've been working with uh, using uh, modern uh, control theory and, and uh, uh, computing technologies, as well as this uh, notion of uh, regenerative medicine and other things in the critical care unit. So thank you very much for having me.